Hey, at Tag Cyber, we often bring working chief information security officers in to chat about themes and priorities and issues. So here we are at the beginning of 2023, and I have one of the best here in the studio with us. It's my friend Ramin Safai, and we're going to ask him some questions about zero trust and identity and anything else he wants to talk about. So stick around. If you're interested in what CISOs are thinking, you're in the right place. Hi, this is Adam Moroso from Tag Cyber. I want to welcome you to our video. I've got an awesome guy in the, in the studio here with us. Um, Ramin Safai is the CISO for Jefferies here in New York City. And um, I'm going to ask him some questions about zero trust and identity. And Ramin, welcome to, to, the, to uh, our little modest studio here. Great to be here. Amazing studio, I have to say, in an amazing location. Thank it, you for inviting it's me. nice to see you. Thank hey, you. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions about sort of 2023 and priorities and so on. But tough first year, of all, year, how's yeah. everything going? How are you doing? How's work and everything? You know, work is great so far this year, although it's been a hard year when it comes to the budgeting process yeah. for us compared to normal years. For your audience, I'd like to introduce Jeffries about what Jeffries is mm -hmm. and what, because it's not a common name yes, that your, 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 your clients may be familiar with. Jeffries is an investment bank is a fin in financial services. We do investment banking services similar to the likes of Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, we are number six globally uh, when it comes to M&As and in uh, equities trading. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are growing year over year. So it's good to be in a business that is growing and it's good to be in financial services, which is always very high tech. How long have you run the security program there? So I joined them about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I joined them 10 years ago and I've been managing the cybersecurity team since then. You have been one of the icons. You know, it's not easy to stick in a job that it's long. It's not easy to be in a, in a, in a CISO role for, for 10 years. It is not easy to be in financial services in a CISO role for 10 years. Definitely, you are dealing with lots of attacks, lots of issues on a daily basis. So it is an interesting job, keeps it interesting. So there's two big topics I want to ask you about. They're sort of buzzwords, but I think there's a lot behind them. But the first is zero trust. Definitely a buzzword. I just want to say buzzword. It's kind of a buzzword, right? 100 out of 100. You want to There's say probably maybe? some stuff useful about it, but I want to get your thoughts. Fair. I won't I won't bias it. And second, identity. I know that's something you're very passionate about. And maybe identity hygiene in particular. I want to get your advice on that. But let's start with zero trust, which is the number one marketing term ever for vendors. I, but what, what do you guys think about zero trust? Is that a, a, a I, real thing for you guys at the program level? I want to say yes and no. Yeah. So there are parts of zero trust when I come across companies that they use the term probably incorrectly and they're just trying to sell a product. Yeah. I remember walking uh, at RSA conference last year and every company, every second company that you see has a zero trust, uh, cloud security, something attached to its name. So there is definitely a lot of fake news and fluff in there, mm. in the terminology being used. At the same time, at Jefferies, we take it seriously about knowing who's connecting to us, making sure we identify whatever device, user is connected to us, and not giving them any access until they're identified. And that's what our definition of the zero trust is, yeah. mixing the identity with access, physical access, network access, and connectivity. When people talk about like ZTNA, Zero Trust Network Access, is that a real thing? Is that something like in, in the context of maybe traditional VPN to the edge, to the enterprise versus having this cloud-based sort of access, is that an important priority for you guys? Well, I want to say the architecture of the VPN really has changed since the beginning of yeah. the pandemic when people started working from home. Yeah. That architecture really moved to the SASE architecture yeah. that we are currently using. We are a Palo Alto shop and we, we use the Palo Alto architecture and nearly every device that we issue to their users have, has a certificate. Without that certificate, you're not able to even connect. On top of that, you need your multi-factor authentication to make sure that we know who you are. So if the device is lost, we know that you are actually authenticating to the, to the system. That was not the architecture in the past. When we were using yeah. VPN, it was you could use any device, connect to us using the VPN, uh, and it will prompt you for a user ID password. So that architecture has really fundamentally changed since the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, I remember, I must be 15 years ago, having a meeting with Google, and, and they were showing me 
it was probably 15, maybe 10 years ago. They were showing me that concept where you put the certificates on, they called it Beyond Corp. Maybe they still call it that. But I thought it was great. We were trying to do something similar in telecom and nobody called it Zero Trust then. But I remember thinking it might catch on and it, it sort of did. Like you, you think the, um, was it the pandemic that really pushed it over? Like everybody kind of. So the architecture on? was there, but it yeah. was definitely the funding and actually the implementation was not there. You so had to do it. We, we had to do it and we had to do it in a very short period of time. And we had to do it for different devices. It wasn't just your mobile device or your laptop but it was also your, your uh, phone, as an example, that yeah. we were issuing to the users. So as we began to issue high volume of equipment to users' home, it became necessary because mm -hmm. otherwise you can't identify what's connecting to you and who's connecting to you. So definitely picked up during the pandemic. The architecture existed in our lab or in our, maybe in small pilots, but it wasn't as widespread. Do you think most companies will continue in some sort of a hybrid mode where there's still some sort of a perimeter and then Clatter, do you think eventually perimeter just goes away? Um, so at least for Jefferies, the hybrid world is continuing. Yeah. So we are back to three to four days in the office. And as far as I can call it right now, I think hybrid will continue to be the trend. Yeah. It's the most efficient way. You're in the office some days, you meet with your colleagues and friends, you have face-to-face -face meetings, and you work from home whenever you need to work from home. It doesn't have to be specific yeah. days. So I think that hybrid architecture remains. I think the fact that you can work from anywhere is fantastic, and people are expecting more. So it was interesting during the pandemic, so obviously a lot of technology went into the end user computing. And when people came back to the office, the technology in the office was backwards. So in the 2022, we had to upgrade our technology in the office, which is itself a reverse problem. Uh, going forward, my guess is that we have to maintain upgrading both of them at the same time. So as you upgrade one side, the other side gets upgraded. That introduces a cost. So how much business wants to take that cost? Right now, it seems like they're happy to take it. It really doubles the end user computing cost from many perspectives, from a licensing perspective, from a, from actual physical hardware perspective, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's funny, we're, uh, for us, I used to go in four days a week, now it's about two, so cut in half. And we use public infrastructure, we do overlay, do basically okay. zero trust overlay on top. So for even a small company like ours, we've, we've made the, the transition, the pandemic was something that pushed that you had us to actually over. Push it. it made a difference. I'm, I'm not sure we would have gone that far had it not been for pretty much everybody being home 100% of the time for two years. That is very true. So that really changed things. So, so to sum up, Zero Trust is not a fiction in the context of, say, the day-to-day -day work. From many companies' perspective and their buzzwords, it is fiction. <laughs> I have to say that. So. But I mean, but it references the, the SaaS it exists. and so on. Things exist. Now. Correct. I think that that's reasonable. That's okay. correct. So that's good. We've now got that resolved. Now let's go to an easy topic, real simple. Identity. <laughs> identity and identity hygiene. That's something you and I are both pretty passionate about. So identity hygiene, I guess, is a way of referencing that you're doing it right, if you have idea, or at least that's the way I think about it. But talk to me about it, or talk, share with everyone here yeah, a little bit so about your, your thoughts on identity. First of all, a background about me and identity. I'm very passionate about identity. I, I started my career at security as the head of identity management uh, at Lehman Brothers. Mm -hmm. And at that time... You pulled the short straw. <laughs> I, I was just a developer, and I was given the responsibility of go develop this workflow application and, and, and put it together and, and basically create this identity management solution. And at the time, there was nothing out of the box that you could go buy from any company. Yeah. Active Directory was just becoming the standard. It yeah. wasn't really the standard. If you remember, there was a, oh, lot of, yeah. a lot of alternative standards to it. It's amazing how that really has Indeed it has. Over. So that's huge. And I would say 90% of our problems that actually stays in the identity hygiene is that management of data, which is in that active directory. Yeah. Because over time, it has become our repository of everything from end user the uh, devices. Source of identity truth. It's from right. device management to user management to service account management, non-human account management. It is the source of truth. And Microsoft really doesn't provide you with that many 
technologies to manage the life cycle of a user there. So they just give you a database and say, you know what, go add, delete whatever you want to do in that database. Or buy from vendors. Or buy from vendors. Whatever. And, and the result is a mess. In most companies, when you, when I, I, every company that I have joined, typically the number of identities in their Active Directory is larger than the number of employees by many, many times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you end up well, with... the service accounts are part of that, right? Service accounts are part of it, but even if you add the service no, accounts, you don't expect it's such right. a large deviation that from... That is a funny thing when that happens. Uh, and, not so and, and, I, and yeah, so I remember like, well, in my <laughs> early days uh, at Lehman Brothers, when the total number of employees was 20,000 and the total number of accounts was well over 200,000. And you go, that, that just makes no sense. What happened? Why is there such a huge mismatch between identities? You see identities? that like with um, when Brian Krebs will like report that there's a breach. <laughs> the initial report is 200,000 accounts and then the company comes in and goes, no, 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 it's oh, only 50. And you know, they have like 150,000 bad entries. And <laughs> yeah, so, and, and the truth is that it takes only one account yeah. to be the, the, the Achilles heel for you and actually let you fail if you have the wrong password there, right. if you haven't rotated the password, if that password is hard-coded somewhere, you have a problem. So there is a lot of issues. So if you don't have the hygiene program, quote-unquote, that means you're not managing the life cycle of an identity. Yes, you can create the accounts very efficiently. You may even delete the accounts very efficiently. But then if you have too many accounts compared to the actual accounts that you meant to have, yeah. there's something wrong in that architecture. And the concept of identity hygiene is to make sure, A, you clean it up once, and B, you keep it clean. So you have an evergreen process. So when you actually clean it, you have a watch process that makes sure you don't deviate from where you should be. What is the role of com modern compliance in that? Is it a positive impact? A neutral or negative impact? And, and when I, you refer to compliance, the compliance teams the or compliance? standards, you know, the external sort of pressure that you and I and others feel so the to audits, deal with compliance. So audits definitely audit, help. So audits, regulatory. regulatory audits and compliance definitely help So that's that. a positive thing. That's a positive okay. thing. However, they are typically narrow focused. Yeah. And for that narrow focus, there has always been attention. Yeah. If it's a SOX audit or if it's a application that is managed by Fed or, or any other area, within those areas, there's always a lot of focus. But as soon as you come out of it, the focus may not be there. Because again, your Achilles heel may not be the main application. It could be a third party application that no one uses and it's like a lower priority application in your network. Yeah, I've because always been, I mean, I mean, for me, I, I agree that um, when there are findings then generally you can get budget to fix it. So that's a good exactly. thing. So I, I agree. Not a good thing if you're in the job for a long time. You gotta be careful, findings. right? Yeah, it's yeah. great with that. So for people watching, if you're a new CISO, it's Perfect. awesome to have 200 a, a, findings, blame yeah. the last guy. Exactly. But after you've been around a little bit, after you want a few to, years, you wanna make sure you that you make clean. Sure too much. So really, yeah. I don't do at least work based on the findings. We try to find them ahead of time is, yeah. the, is, the, is the concept. Don't wait for the finding. Yeah. You wanna be squeaky Go clean. Get them. Go get them before because after so many years, you, you don't have the uh, blame game. But here's the thing, I'm, I want to ask you this. Uh, innovation usually is not something you standardize on. You, we standardize on things we do every day. So when you, in, when you see innovative new things in identity, some new tool or approach, or like using AI to do something, it always makes me a little nervous because this is such a compliance-rich component of a program that when you try to do something different, my experience has been, it's easy to get the auditors and the regulators a little nervous or even just confused about what you're doing. I think it's tended to keep things very straight and narrow in identity. Am I thinking about that right? Or you, it's like I you think don't innovate are, enough. I there. think you're, 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 you're absolutely correct in the sense that there has been a lot of prescription about what yeah. needs to happen. Everyone doing everyone the same thing. Everyone doing the thing. same thing. However, that architecture of everybody doing the same thing has still highlighted that there's many gaps in yeah. the overall architecture. Yeah, that's true. And what the new generation of tools, which are especially cloud-oriented large data and big data analytics behind them and finding needle in a haystack issues, 
allows us to find that needle in a haystack that we may have fallen through one of the cracks. Yeah. And that's only possible because of the new technologies. And that's identity hygiene. That right? is identity yeah, hygiene. That's it in Basically, a yeah. you have the log files, the ability to go through millions of records, identify the misappropriate creation of accounts or usage of the accounts or, or not accounts that should have been cleaned and they haven't been cleaned and your system says they're clean but they're not clean. So identifying that gap between reality and, the, and what, it, what it should be is the, co is the goal of the project. Service accounts are a particular problem. Service accounts are by far the hardest one to manage. Yeah. Let me just say, user accounts are relatively straightforward. There are many tools to manage the user accounts. When it comes to service accounts, there's a big gap between where one should be and what even is available out in the market, let me just say. Because service accounts are typically used by various systems. Yeah. It depends on the owner of the service, how they can utilize it. So it's not very easy to put them into a vault like CyberArk. If it is, then straightforward, you can solve the problem. In many cases, they cannot because the application cannot utilize that architecture. So you need to make sure the passport is managed correctly, it's rotated on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. It is not, you're not causing any outage by changing the password because somebody forgot to change one application's password. Yeah. So by far the most complex area is service account management. Yeah, place where you need, like Sphere is an example of a platform that would help with something like that. That's correct. So for example, we, we use Sphere for this account cleanup uh, together with many of the other work they yeah. do regarding network share cleanup. Right. So we use them for a variety of services in that space uh, for all the hygiene and the cleanup of our environment to make sure we keep it clean. I, I think that if I were to predict a topic that'll still be an issue in a few years, Probably identity, right? I mean, it's the so gift that keeps giving, right? Identity <laughs> is, at least for my budget, oh. I, I want to say at least 40% of our budget is spent on identity yeah. when it comes to security. That and I about can, right. And I cannot see that changing and in the foreseeable with that, with future. sort of de-emphasis on the DMZ, then it becomes even more important. I mean, right? you started by talking about zero trust. Yeah. Everything is identity. Identity becomes Cloud, the thing. everything is identity. Yeah network segmentation in the cloud, everything is identity. Yeah. So if you don't manage the identity, good luck. many things break immediately. So you need to have a very good governance around identity. What have we not talked about? I, I wanted those two topics. Those are big. That's on everybody's minds. Any other big themes for 23 coming I've, up for you? I think 2023 is a cloud. Uh, continuing yeah. as, yeah. as uh, from 2022, a lot of movement within our organization and demand to move to the cloud Sure. Use more services in the cloud, ability to go faster in the cloud, and ability to use uh, new technologies like ChatGPT and all the other yeah, AI tools. Cool, isn't it? So <laughs> the, the the use cases are infinite. So getting to a bit, enable the business to take advantage of it is oh, the yeah. key. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of our effort in cyber is going towards enabling those services for the business. Yeah, so good. a lot more to happen in that area. I think that's the growth area for the coming year. For well, sure. keep doing the good work that you're doing. I really we appreciate, appreciate the opportunity appreciate to speak to you. Appreciate what you do. Come back. We'll, we'll get back together in a year and see how you're doing. Good. Thank you so much for see your time. If you're still enjoying the job. Thank you. Good. Have a great year. Thank you so much. And for everyone else watching, we'll see you next time.